From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. Pastor Clay's on vacation this week. With this week's message, here's Steve Pierce. As I said to people who've said nice things to me before, I'd much rather hear Clay, um, but uh, he's on a well-deserved break, and uh, now you get me for today. So I try to think of doing something a bit different, which is kind of what I'm known for. And today I want to speak about the names of God because, or the name of God, and do something a little different. Names are really important, aren't they? Your name, I mean, is important. And I'm always, when I think about names and the names of God, I remind myself of the story that I heard, and I believe it's true. And it comes from back in the 1800s in England. And uh, in a park, I think it was like Windsor Park or somewhere, there were a couple of little boys playing. One of them happened to be the Earl of Gloucester, and the other happened to be one of the princes, Prince of Wales. And uh, they were just playing around, playing around, playing around. And here comes a little kid from the streets, a little, I guess they would call him in those days, a street urchin. Okay, so here comes this little kid, and he starts playing with them. They're having a great time, and lo and behold, here walks a bobby, policeman. So one of the kids picks up a stone and throws it and knocks the bobby's hat off. So in the ensuing chase, all three of them were caught. So the bobby now trying to instill a, a sense of respect for the law, he says to the first one, he says, okay, young man, holds out his uh, notebook and his pencil, he says, what's your name? He says, sir, uh, I am the Earl of Gloucester. And the second guy, and the bobby looks at him, but he nonplussed, he writes, Earl of Gloucester. Um, and young man, what's your name? He says, uh, my name is, uh, I'm the Prince of Wales. By this time, the other little kid, man, he's just, wait, whoo. So they come to the little kid and they said to him, and son, what's your name? He says, sir, I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> yeah, you know, names are important. And it's interesting for me when you read the Scriptures that God's name was unknown for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Nobody knew God's name. Over and over in the Bible, we read about the patriarchs uh, asking, Who are you? What's your name? And who shall I tell them sent me? Men and women followed God without even knowing His name. They knew what He was like. He was powerful and caring and loving. He is a God who could heal and win battles, make the sun stand still and part the sea. But when you have a friend, when you have a friend, isn't one of the first things you want to know, hey, what's your name? When I met Linda for the first time, way back in 1973, many of you don't know this uh, about her, that she was a member of a really bad biker gang, uh, similar to the Hells Angels that we have here. And um, I was able to rescue her from this, uh, from this gang. And uh, it was really tough. Ask her to show you her tattoo later. Okay. And uh, the school that she went to, uh, she graduated with a major in knife throwing. Most of you don't know that, okay? But one of the first things when I met her for the first time was, hey, what's that babe's name? What's her name? Well, in the Bible, time had passed, and the Hebrew people began to understand the bigger picture of God. The first thing that they discovered, an important name, was a covenant name for God called Jehovah. Now, um, in modern-day Israel, they're not allowed to say that name. It's too holy. Um, and it is, uh, it is written with what's called the sacred tetragrammaton. It's four consonants in Hebrew, a ya and a ha and a v and a ha. So it's, it's unpronounceable because there's no vowels in it. But Jehovah is the way we say it in English. Um, and what they discovered that Jehovah was not a proper name as such, like Steve or uh, Sam or Linda or whatever. Jehovah was actually a verb. I am who I am. I will always be what I, what I am. I am the God who is from the beginning, the eternal one. 
I'm from everlasting to everlasting. I'm Emmanuel. I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the bread of life, the cornerstone, precious and elect in Zion. I'm the light of the world, the Lord of glory, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm a burden bearer, a fortress. I'm a high tower. I'm a shield. I can buckle your shoes. I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords and Jehovah God is my name. And so I want to talk a little bit about His name this morning. His name is a conquering name. Philippians 2.10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And I looked up that word every in Greek and guess what it means? You got it. Every. Every. Even those who unwillingly will do so, those who never thought they would do so, those who don't want to, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. The first time that Jesus came to earth, He was born in a cave with cows and sheep and donkeys, dazed shepherds and adoring parents. But the next time He will come, He's going to sit on the throne of His father David. He's going to set up His temple on the mount in the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says, of His kingdom there will be no end. Kings, queens and presidents and dictators will line up and bow before a carpenter's son. And they will say, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. The high and mighty before a suffering servant. Won't that be a sight, eh? The God deniers, the God haters, the arrogant and the proud, the atheists and the agnostics will stand there and they will bow before the King of Kings because His name is a conquering name. Secondly, His name is a saving name. In Matthew 21, verse 1, it says, You shall call His name Jesus for He will save His people from their sin. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I, I don't know if you know this, but Buddha can't save you. Muhammad nor the Virgin Mary, church membership, baptism cannot save you. Washington, D.C. certainly can't save you. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I am the only way. There is no other name given to man by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. I can stand here today and claim exclusivity for the saving power of the name of Jesus. You've got to trust Him. Our answer is in heaven. Now, the main part, what I wanted to get to today, I'll take some time and explain this to you. His name is a mysterious name. I want to unravel today one of the parts of the mystery and offer it to you to think about and perhaps uh, just it will help you with one aspect of your life that I'll explain later. Maybe we've missed this. Did you know that, men, that our, the roots of our faith are in Judaism? We talk about the Judeo-Christian faith. Our roots lie in, in, uh, in Judaism. Because Jesus is the nicest Jew that I know. Come on, I mean, it's right. I once, uh, I, uh, you may not have heard of this uh, gentleman, Professor David Block. He's a world-known, world-known, uh, yeah, him too. Um, astrophysicist who proved mathematically the existence of a star that nobody had ever found when he was 17. I mean, this clever dude. And I got to preach at his wedding. And his wedding was full of the synagogue. It was in our church, but because he's a completed Jew. So there's like a hundred and whatever Jews there. And so we started off, myself and another pastor, and we said, we want to thank the Jewish people here today for giving us our Messiah. 
What a cool way of saying to, to a Jewish person, hey, we want to find uncommon ground? Well, you know, you ram it down their throat that you killed Jesus, which isn't true. But, you know, that's not going to win friends. But how about saying, you know, I want to thank you so much for giving us our Messiah, because he's the nicest Jew that I know. I found something in modern Judaism that's shrouded in mystery. It points to the great name of God, Jehovah. It's an article of clothing that if you were to go to Israel, you'll see it every day. It's worn by devout Jews as they pray, and it has a deep meaning. It's called the Talit, T-A-L-L-I-T. And I happen to have one. It's worn by Orthodox Jews as they pray, and it, only, it not only has the name of God on it, but uh, it contains the uh, name of God in uh, various different ways. Uh, let's see if I can, oops, if I can put it on right. Okay, but it, it contains the name of God in all kinds of mysterious ways. I told you I was going to have problems with this. All right, here we go. Now, where is it found in the Bible? Well, it's found in the Bible in Numbers chapter 15, 37 to 41. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. Then you will remember to obey my, all my commands and be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Today I'm wearing a modern representation of the talit. In the bottom, the little cords of different lengths, you'll notice, and different numbers of knots and windings. That's called the tzitzit. Okay, there's Hebrew words here. Uh, shalom, shalom. Uh, Yadosh, Lim. I haven't got a clue what that means. I'm getting rusty in my Hebrew. But I want to explain to you now. In fact, I wish this were knotted better. Oh, there's more Hebrew over here. Okay. It occurs to me when I was having a look at this uh, uh, Talit that the Hebrew number system has letters of their alphabet that correspond to numbers. And so on, I think it's this chord here, there are 15 coils, 10 and then 5. And this here is 11 coils, 6 and 5. And in Hebrew, 10 equals yud, 5 equals hey, 6 equals vav, and 5 equals hey. It's the name of God. It's the name of God written in the coils called the tzitzit on their prayer shawl. Now you're saying, well, so what? Let me tell you, you're going to get a huge so what in a minute. The name of God is all over this uh, uh, this prayer shawl. And it's worn, like I said, by Jews when they would go to pray. At the Wailing Wall, you see it. At the temple, uh, uh, the parts of the Temple Mount that they can go to, you see it. On this side, there are 13 coils. 13 in Hebrew is the same uh, number, and it means one. And what they're saying is on this side, Jehovah is one. There's one God that we serve. Now we believe that. We believe the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. In total, right around the, um, the fringe, the tzitzit, there are 613 threads. Why? Because there are 613 laws that the Jews uh, uh, in their Talmud I have to adhere to in order to keep themselves pure from generation to generation. You see, God was trying to get his people 
back on the straight and narrow. And they laid down rules for living. And the talit, when they would wear it, reminds them of the rules and the laws put in place by God to keep His people close to them. And to remind them that His Word is powerful amongst, uh, beyond any other word. Now we believe that. We believe that the Word of God is powerful above all other words. You see, folks, the Word of God has always been a problem for the devil. King David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word for hid in Hebrew is the same word as memorize. Thy word have I memorized. We don't memorize God's word anymore. We want the kids to do that. We want them to learn the word. And, and what happened at camp, I'm so excited that people are wor- learning the word of God. Because the word of God is a problem. The, t- the tassels on the talit were, were to remind us that we're not to go after other gods, but we're to keep ourselves within the, in the boundaries of God's playground. We're not to go prostituting ourselves after other gods because for 400 years, Israel had been doing that. And so we have a clear command to memorize the Word of God. And why do we memorize the Word of God? Read it over and over and over and try and tuck it into our memory. Because the Word I memorize is the Word that God can, through the Holy Spirit, bring to the front. And I can say that in times when I need a Word. I wish I just had a Word for this friend that I'm witnessing to. I just, if I could have a Word, don't tell him what you think. Tell him what the Bible says. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness... He went straight to the word that he had memorized. It is written. It is written. It is written. So let me tell you now, Satan isn't afraid of my education. He's not afraid of my economic power, my university degrees. He's not even afraid of my opinion. Satan fears the word of God because thy word is truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. The book that we love and read is a God-breathed book. He's terrified because I know the Word of God and I can defeat Satan by this. Nothing is impossible to those that believe and are called according to His purpose. And so we shouldn't worship any star, rock star, movie star, sports star. We should worship the bright and morning star. We should worship the star of Bethlehem, the son of the living God. So let's take a little journey back in time. That's what I want to do this morning. Let's go back to the time of Moses in the wilderness to figure out the backstory behind the talit, the prayer shawl. Now those of you who've been to Israel, folks, you'll have seen this over and over again. There'll be pictures uh, on the internet. It's, it's full of pictures. So here's a problem. You've got two million people. How do you get them into church? How do you you get them to worship God together? The tabernacle was only 18 feet by 45 feet. So every man was told to go, hey, listen, go into your own tabernacle and worship the Lord. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I haven't built a tabernacle. Yes, you have. Because the word talit and tabernacle come from the same root. And so when they were told to go and build their own tabernacle, that's what they did. They went simply and made a little tabernacle with their talit. And they worshipped God just like that. It's as old as Israel itself. That's the way they worshipped. The talit was a little place for them to say, this is my church. This is where I can go to worship God. If you have a look at the flag of Israel today, the white and blue, same colors of the prayer shawl and the star, with the star of David. God brought these Jewish people from 66 nations because God said it would happen. And it did in 1948. I will gather together the exiles of Israel. So, do you remember Elijah and Elisha? Elijah was the senior prophet with the booming voice. Elisha was the protege and had a squeaky little voice. Elijah had a leather girdle. That God used to produce miracles. It was a prayer shawl 
that was made, we believe, from camel's hair. He hit the Jordan River with a prayer shawl and it divided. Elijah prayed for the widow's son by putting a prayer shawl over the boy's body. And he took the coils of the tzitzit. Because the tzitzit means the name of God. And he put the coils of the prayer shawl in the dead little boy's hand. Why? Because he was saying to him, you take hold of the name of God, my boy, and see what God can do. Take hold of the name of God and see what he can do. Do you know that there's a name for God for every life situation that we face? He's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He's Jehovah Rapheka, the God who heals. He's Jehovah Tzidkenu, the God who is righteous. He is the lily of the valley, the beautiful God. He's the bright and morning star, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's everything for all that we need. And so Elijah said, put this in the boy's hand. And the boy was revived in the name of the living God. Elijah prayed and the boy came back to life. In the New Testament, Mark 5, 41 Jesus put the girl's hands on the prayer shawl and shouted these words. And I don't know if you've wondered about this. He shouted, Talitha kum. Actually, that sounds like pretty neat when I say it like that. Talitha kum. Sounds a lot like vibe, bass here. Yeah. Okay. I told them to make me sound decent. And they did. Okay. Talitha kum. Talit. Talitha kum. You in the prayer shawl arise. Jesus had put his prayer shawl over the child and released the power of God's name. Back in the Old Testament, in the time of Elisha and Elijah, when they were take, Elijah was taken into heaven, you will receive this mantle and a double portion of power. It's too cool to gloss over, so let me read it to you. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and they asked him, Do you know the Lord's going to take your master from you today? Yeah, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord, Lord lives. That's another way of saying, No way, Jose. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elijah, Elisha replied. Mm. You've asked the difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not be. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. He was reminding him, I'm seeing what's taking place here. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of the garment, tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him, went back and stood, now here's the crunch time, stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided right and left. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went and met him and bowed on the ground. God was with him. Now, I don't know if you know this. He prayed and said, give me a double portion of Elisha, Elijah's blessing. Did you know if you read the scriptures, Elijah performed seven miracles. Guess how many the scripture has that Elisha does. Go on, take a guess. Fourteen. God gave him exactly a double portion. 
In Mark 5, this is so cool. In Mark chapter 5 is the story about the woman with an issue of blood. She comes to Jesus and she says to herself, if only I could touch the hem of his garment. Do you remember that? Did you know that the word for hem in Greek is the word krispadon? And the word krispadon in Greek means a knotted and twisted rope. If I can just take hold of the name of God like it is on the hem, on the, on the tzitzit of his talit, I know I'll be healed. And I think we need to learn that. We need to take hold of the hem, the name of God, as it's symbolized by this. This is just an article of clothing to me. But it has such deep symbolic meaning. She took the name of God in her hand and her faith made her well. Twelve years of bleeding, she was unclean and she should have announced it when she came near any people. But faith overcame fear and she reached out to Jesus and took hold of his name. Listen, when you got saved, you took hold of the name of Jesus as your Savior. If you didn't, you're not saved. You've got to take hold of the name of Jesus, my Savior. She looked to Jesus, reached out to Him, put His name in her hand, and was healed. She knew nothing about theology. <laughs> she didn't know anything about doctrinal orthodoxy, semi-Pelagianism. Uh, what was the other ones we were talking about the other day? Uh, hyper, well, well, whatever it was. She didn't know that stuff. She just knew by faith, if I can take hold of the name of Jesus, Joshua, Messiah, Savior, I will be healed. And I want to say to you today that you and I should be calling on the name of the Lord and waiting for God's power to fall on our lives. And so finally, I want to look at the prayer shawl, the talit, and the resurrection. It was a common belief in John 26 and 27 that the Roman government kind of thought the disciples of Jesus would steal the body because he'd been speaking openly about the fact that he would die and rise again in three days. They were petrified that this, this carpenter from Nazareth would rise again from the dead. Why did they fear him? Well, listen, the man who could feed 5,000 from a sack lunch, he'd make a pretty good general. I mean, let's face it, that, you know, you're going to have some issues with that. So in John 20, verses 6 and 7, here's what happened at the resurrection. Simon Peter came along, and behind, uh, came along behind him, went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, that was the burial cloth, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. How many of you know how that cloth was laying in the tube. It was folded very neatly and very carefully. This was the burial cloth. I wonder if it could have been Jesus' prayer shawl. You see, the soldiers had cast lots for his one-piece garment. That was pretty rare, and it was a pretty nice piece of clothing to have. But what would a Roman soldier want with a talit? He's not going to want that. It was folded exactly like the Jewish people folded. Because Jesus knew that Peter would be the first one in the tomb. And if he saw the body gone, he could have easily said, the Romans have him. And so when they came across the tomb, I wonder if you've read this or heard about this before or know of this. The fact that this prayer cloth was lying folded 
and one part of the tomb, away from the strips of linen, says three things. Whoever folded it was Jewish. Whoever folded it was alive. And whoever folded it was not in a hurry. The Romans didn't steal the body of Jesus. Jesus took his time about walking out of the tomb because he is the victor over death, hell, and the grave. And the folded cloth is evidence that this was something that Jesus had planned and knew. The strips of linen that his body were wrapped in, they weren't important. His cloak, and his outer uh, garment uh, was, was long gone. The Romans had that baby. But his prayer shawl was folded and lying at one place. And so, in the book of Revelation, we have the last mention of the talit. Revelation 19 from verse 11. It says there, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Woo-hoo! No one knows. Back in the, this is a loop back to Genesis and Exodus. Nobody knew. Now at the end, nobody knew this name. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. And his name, well, his name's the Word of God. When we see a Jewish man wearing this shawl, they are trying to be obedient to God from thousands of years ago. How many of you have noticed that in the story of uh, in the story, in the record of Revelation, it says that on his thigh he has this name written. How many of you remember that? On his thigh he has a name written. If you sit down on a saddle of a horse or on any kind of situation where you are seated, when you sit down like this, it's not a tattoo that's on his, on his thigh. When you sit down, the cords of the talit, the tzitzit, fall naturally on your thigh. The name of God on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> you're all very quiet here. I think you're trying to figure this out. Here then, because Linda said to me this week, Steve, so what? And I think that's pretty neat. When you get to this point now, to ask, I'm done with that now, to ask, so what? So what that I've heard an interesting account, some of it may be just theory, and I've got my glasses so wrapped in the, oh, there you go. So what? Is this just for information? I pray that as I preach, that it's not for information, but for transformation. If this prayer shawl is to remind us about the greatness of God, let me ask you about your prayer life. Let me ask you about the praying that you engage in. All you have now is an interesting piece of Jewish history. And so the what, the so what is about this. The prayer life of a Jewish man was all about Yahweh, Jehovah. What's your prayer life about? Is it about you? Mm, red light. Is it about your needs? Mm, red light. I mean, God encourages us to pray for our needs. But the talit reminds us that the real focus of prayer should be on the worship of one true God. Yes, He is a prayer-answering God. But I wonder if you've ever taken some time in your life and done what I have done again recently, and I do it regularly. I pray about my praying. Because I find my praying a lot, Lord, I, you know how I need this and how I need that. And the needs are usually the things that I would like to get. 
Lord, I, I want this or I need that. How often do our prayers reflect the name of God? How often do we say to people, reach out and take hold of the name of God? Some people here today might need to take hold of Jesus as Savior. Somebody here might need to take hold of Jesus as a healer. Somebody here might need to take hold of Jesus as someone who will provide. Someone here might need to take hold of Jesus as the one who brings peace and joy into your heart. I wonder what is the focus of your prayer life. Whether you cry out and call upon His name. Is it praying about the needs that seem to overwhelm you? And boy, do they overwhelm us. We have a lot of those. Or is your prayer life about the awesome majesty and power of God And our need to immerse ourselves in Him. Lift up His name, folks. Glory in His presence. Cry out and call upon Him. Let me ask you, if you have arrived at the place in your life where you should continually go, where you are satisfied just in Him. Where you are satisfied, Lord, I am satisfied just in You. Yeah, I'd like a new car. I'd like that. I'd like that. And and you know, you've told me to pray about that stuff and I'm doing it. But Lord, I'm praying about my praying right now. And I want my praying to be more about You and Your majesty and Your glory than it is about me and my needs. Let me tell you, there are plenty of Christians that can tell you about theology and ask difficult questions, who can remind you that they know a whole bunch about the Bible. It's sad to think that they think themselves mature. Ask them about prayer. What's their plan and their purpose in prayer? Is it to get stuff from God? Eh. Let me ask you today, if you would get on your knees and take hold of the name of God that you need today, Lord, I need encouraging. I just just want to have a prayer like, like Steve has described here, that I'm immersed in the presence of the Spirit of God in my life. I know there are needs, Lord, but I'm going to just put them aside right now. I want to know more, more, more about Jesus. I want to cry out and call upon His name. If you're not satisfied in Him, get on your knees and take hold of His name and pray. Prayer is nothing more than Talking to Jesus. When I first got saw, uh, saved back in 1975 at Little Resentful Baptist Church in Johannesburg, that's what I learned. Why? Because we went to prayer meetings. And we heard the prayers of these mature saints as they would pray for the glory of God to fall. They would pray that the name of God would be uplifted. They would pray that, that God would be glorified in their lives. Bring your requests to God, but don't let that overwhelm you. We invite you to come worship with us at Cross Culture Church in Raleigh. We gather each Sunday morning in a casual and comfortable atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross Culture Church may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, fun, and safe kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.